Thank you very much for being here today with me. Please tell me your name and uh, your project. So I am uh, Sandeep. I am one of the co-founders at Polygon. Uh, Polygon is a you know Ethereum scaling platform which is approach agnostic. Uh, that means like you know we have various different kinds of solution. We have a Polygon POS chain. We have Polygon Layer Two. Um, you know in the form of opt- uh, zero knowledge rollups. Uh, we have uh, you know uh, data availability chains and Polygon SDK and a lot of other things. So I- all in all, it's a Ethereum scaling platform. Uh, and yeah, like Polygon, one of the solutions, Polygon POS is currently the uh, one of the most successful and most adopted platforms in this space. What do you think that made you capable of executing faster than uh, Ethereum that had everything uh, going for them, but still taking their uh, leisurely time to achieve uh, uh, a switch over to POS and, uh, and, and everything else? Um, I don't think that uh, you know Ethereum. Uh, you know Ethereum community is taking us leisure time. Uh, leisure time. I mean, it's actually uh, Ethereum is like a you know the most adopted blockchain in the space, right? Like you know it has like seven hundred billion dollars worth of value floating around in it and all that. And in order to scale that, like blockchains are a very um, you know what should I say? Like you know kind of a rigid software. Like you know if, because you have to roll out the updates on the network setting. You have to make sure it's like remains decentralized. It's not like uh, say one single party is running it. And uh, Ethereum in that sense is is you know like again like after I think with Bitcoin I think uh, or even more decentralized than Bitcoin I would say. So in that setting when you have to roll out these software updates, it's very very uh, difficult and challenging. And plus you have this huge amount of hundreds of billions of dollars uh, on Ethereum. So it's hard to scale on layer one. That is why, that is the whole thesis of Polygon, right? So on the layer one, you can't do too many experiments because it's the fundamental layer. And But on the layer two, uh, you know, what Polygon is building on, like, you know, the la- these secondary layer blockchains, there you are free to do more experiments because, you know, these are you know slightly less decentralized than layer one you don't need to decentralize it you know beyond a certain level it, a certain level of uh, decentralization is is good and then you know the security is also coming from ethereum main chain so you can do much more experiments so that's why like you know a, a large number of ethereum community members are also you know trying to scale ethereum on the layer two and then obviously layer one efforts are also there you recently announced uh, an initiative about uh, uh, zero knowledge and tell me about it uh, both why that matters and uh, what the initiative consists in yeah so thesis is the same that you know we want to scale ethereum and then zero knowledge uh, the power of zero knowledge cryptography is, is is such that you know we can do complex computations off chain and then provide very succinct proofs of those uh, you know, computations on Ethereum, which can be proven and, you know, which can be verified properly that, okay, th- this particular computation was done properly. And uh, you can you can move all this execution of, of business logic uh, onto, onto this, uh, sep- you know, onto the layer two. So, uh, although like there are other efforts like optimistic rollups and all that, which have, which got popular uh, attention in the last, uh, you know, six to 12 months, but, you know, our, multiple months of research uh, in the last year we were very clear and we you know very conclusively uh, you know we we realized and were are very convinced that zero knowledge technology is going to be the ultimate uh, you know the backbone of scaling blockchains and b- taking blockchains to the internet scale so hence we you know kind of uh, you know, wanted to go all in on uh, zero knowledge and you know we announced a 1 billion dollar fund we uh, have already announced two solutions. One of them was an acquisition, uh, first ever, uh, uh, you know, like a public network merger. Uh, so where we, uh, you know, uh, took in uh, Hermes solution uh, from, you know, the, the Switzerland-based team uh, that has become Polygon Hermes. And then with Ernst & Young, which is one of the, you know, big four uh, audit firms, uh, their technology division uh, also has this product called Nightfall. So we have a strategic partnership with them and we have multiple more solutions which are yet to be announced and will be announced in the coming weeks. Uh, You are talking about uh, internet scale uh, uh, architectures and uh, certainly uh, blockchain hardware um, has been growing proportionally to blockchain adoption. uh, But still there is a lot of compute available that is not uh, directly on the blockchain. 
do you believe that zero knowledge can represent a conduit that naturally allows blockchain application layers to take advantage of traditional compute? Absolutely, that's the that's the whole uh, premise about it. That you know, with zero knowledge technology, you can compute a very large uh, kind of a program, uh, arbitrary program, and then uh, you know, prove only a very we provide a very succinct proof of that on the on the Ethereum main chain, right? And then you can be on Ethereum main chain, you can be hundred percent sure that this computation was done correctly. So that provides you kind of the holy grail for uh, you know for achieving you know enormous scale uh, for this Web3 technology uh, worldwide. Um, can you give um, a use case uh, when a large computation is required uh, and uh, uh, that uh, uh, this kind of approach can deliver? Yeah. So very simple approach can be like for example in blockchain gaming, right? Right now you only use NFTs uh, like games are only using NFTs and the marketplaces and you know simple asset logic on chain. But you know there have been attempts uh, to kind of have the game logic also on chain, right? I mean because you know gamers are very passionate about these things and there's a multi-billion dollar industry and eventually you want that the game servers are also like the, those those game servers which are run by the gaming companies they are also computing everything in a transparent and decentralized way, right? Uh, so, uh, I mean, you could technically, like, you know, theoretically, right now the technology is not there, but theoretically you could have a large program, like a gaming in program, you could compute them off-chain and then provide inputs uh, or, or kind of a verification of that on, on, on the main chain. Those kind of things are possible. So, um, the execution of the game would still be centralized, but it would be trustless. It would be trustless. Because uh, anyone would be able to prove that the game state yes. is what the centralized engine tells the world. Exactly. And you wouldn't need the same degree of computation available to prove that they are correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you don't need that to be on-chain. It can happen separately and then a succinct proof can come on blockchain. And the power of zero knowledge technology is that, you know, we use something called validity proof. So if let's say they compute something wrongly, that proof will not be allowed even to submit on, on the Ethereum main chain. That proof will simply fail. And then all the gamer community, they simply need a, you know, kind of an alert service where they can say that, hey, game logic has been computed wrongly. So they, the company, if they decide to do that and they compute something wrongly, then they lose the trust of their entire gaming community, which is counterproductive to their business. So it kind of, like, you know, this whole Web3 industry and this experience is about, uh, is about like, you know, we human beings growing out of this institutional trust trust mentality, right? Like in the last 300 years, everything in our human society has become institutions. Government is an institution, bank is an institution, gaming provider is an institution, Facebook is an institution, so Twitter is an institution. And by and large, you know, today where we are, we, we do not want to trust these institutions in any form. And if you see on a, on a, on a like a, you know, a 10,000 feet view, this is exactly what is happening with this Web3 industry. We want the inst even though there are institutions or game developers app developers whatever but we want them to be we want them to be computing first computing things correctly as they project it's not like facebook is you know showing me on my news feed something that their political you know uh, biases say right their uh, news feed algorithms there have been a lot of debate about it so you want these institutions to kind of compute things correctly Right, and then second is our, our data, uh, you know, privacy. Right, so if you see on a larger scale, this is what Web3 technology uh, uh, is all about. Like being providing transparency and trustlessness that we don't need to trust an institution, what they are doing with our, uh, you know, data or our money or our assets. And second, eventually we should be able to get into a data privacy mode where we don't need to share our data. As human beings. And the advantage will be also reciprocal. Uh, uh, as of today, uh, Jan LeCun, who is uh, the chief of AI at Facebook, uh, is very vocal on Facebook trying to convince everyone that the efforts uh, of uh, self-improvement at Facebook are genuine. And nobody believes him. So in, in uh, your uh, future architecture, uh, Facebook will be able to prove to everyone that they are not lying yes. because uh, they will be able to provide uh, that compact proof uh, and anyone will be able to verify that. 
Absolutely, that's the that's the intent in, on the larger scale. Uh, you mentioned NFTs uh, that are uh, together with DeFi today uh, two of the hottest uh, new applications uh, uh, of uh, of blockchain. Uh, what uh, uh, currently uh, is uh, for you exciting about NFC NFTs, and how do you see them evolving uh, in the near future? So, I mean, NFT a large amount of uh, kind of attention that has come to NFTs, you know, has come from these. Uh, abstract art NFTs, right? Which have, you know, these board apes and things like that, which have been selling for millions and millions of dollars. But then NFTs have other categories also, which we believe in the long run are going to be bigger. The the second bigger category is the gaming NFTs, right? So on in game, like people are spending or the, are, you know, the younger generations are spending so much time in, inside these games, you know, which we also call like metaverses. Right. So they buy assets like they buy assets in the real world and all that. Right. So and then deplatforming has been an issue with with these games and game. It has been like kind of a latent demand where uh, the gamers want to control their assets. Secondly, they want to be able to take these assets to secondary markets, which is the play to earn model. Right. What is the play to earn model that you play a game, you earn some assets over there, which you are free to take in the public market and you can sell it off. Right. And you can earn money with that. So the good players can actually earn like you know play games while enjoying the game they can earn some kind of assets which they can sell in the market so that's the play to earn model and then in the larger gaming context this uh, you know is 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 coming up as a as one of the biggest thing because you also people are also realizing that when you when you are when you're providing this liquidity option to the gamer the gamers also end up spending much more money into the game because they know that I am buying this sword, then I can sell it off in the market also again, right? So even as a kid, kid you have hundred dollar budget from your parents to buy some assets. You know that with that hundred dollars, maybe I can buy and sell, and you know I can buy multiple types of assets. So per user spending is also going going higher, which is you know reflecting in a huge amount of revenue in some of the popular games, and uh, you know that's why like all the gamers, gaming companies, big gaming studios are jumping into. It, there is huge amount of investment available in this in the market. That's the second category. The third category where is that is evolving in the NFTs, and which I also feel is going to be much bigger than the you know abstract art NFTs is the brands and celebrities and you know anything that needs engagement and loyalty with their end customers. So we see like you know we recently saw Dolce and Gabbana. They did a big uh, you know uh, uh, collection launch on Polygon. It sold at six million dollars. Uh, in the market and uh, so they are starting with that we see a lot of other big brands like the iconic brands of the world uh, you know looking to get into NFTs and you will see soon enough that each every brand that is launching a new collection every every semester they are going to you know all of their collections will have some sort of NFT you know bindings to it like yeah uh, do you think that there is still uh, a, a certain degree, maybe a large degree of learning that needs to happen on the side of uh, many um, participants uh, in this exciting area? Um, as an example, uh, the NBA clips that have been sold uh, as NFTs were marketed as uh, the ownership by the holder of the NFT of the clip, while in reality the traditional copyright and steaming rights and, and uh, other uh, very well understood and, and uh, litigated uh, rights did not transfer at all yep. with the NFT itself. So I'm sure it was in totally good faith, but there is a mismatch and a miscommunication and, and, and a lot of practices, including legal practices, have to catch up to what the technology already allows. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there is this, I mean, nobody's saying that this industry is matured in any form. Like, it's very, very, very early days. And a lot of things are going to evolve from there. I mean, like, for example, with DAOs also, you see that the state of Wyoming now now realizes or recognizes DAOs as the official this thing, right? I'm pretty sure soon enough, uh, you know, some of these NFT agreements and all that you will be able to attach with that and you know government will say that if you are selling an an, an agreement uh, with an nft then it can be honored in a in a court of law right so mm -hmm. those kind of things will evolve these these patterns will evolve and uh, you know the industry will keep growing but the main fundamental point is that uh, you know there is a product market fit 
for NFTs and DeFi, and that's not going to go away. Like unlike 2017-18 when everything was vaporware, this time we have a product market fit. And you know, of course, it will go from the hype cycle to the realization and plateaus and all that, but it is going to stay here. So, um, what role does Polygon play in the world of DeFi? So, you know, in terms of DeFi, Polygon is, uh, as I said, that you know, after Ethereum, it's one, one of the biggest platform. Almost all the top DeFi protocols are also on Polygon. And many of them, as I was saying that, you know, uh, Polygon's daily active users are much larger now than Ethereum main chain itself. And most of our platforms or the protocols have larger number of daily active users on Polygon versus Ethereum. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, that's like a trend that we see is going to eventually keep keep evolving, right? So, so on the DeFi side, like, you know, as I'm saying that, you know, almost the entire DeFi ecosystem is available on Polygon. Polygon, And Polygon has proven that if you are able to provide less cost transactions, people are willing to interact with these platforms more, willing to interact with DeFi, willing to interact with DAOs, willing to interact with NFTs and, and you know, games uh, and, and things like that much more. So, so I mean, that's that's where Polygon is. A lot of things are going uh, the right way for Polygon. Uh, what are areas that worry you uh, in the next uh, few months uh, or maybe a couple of years? What are the things, in your opinion, that uh, the Polygon developer community or core uh, should really concentrate on so that this uh, streak of uh, winning uh, achievements is maintained? Yeah, I mean, um, I would say that, you know, we have some committed uh, timelines and products uh, you know which are going to which are you know just recently announced and all that so one key factor the first and most important thing is we need to make sure that we keep shipping the next stage projects like right now our current product is good it can cater to probably a million users you know 2 million users but what happens when the number of users on these applications expand from 1 million users to you know 10 million users right so what are the solutions we are going to launch in the next six to eight months that is very crucial second is you know our developer focus needs to remain uh, you know as as strong as ever we have we are gen largely considered to be a very very supportive ecosystem and uh, as the scale is increasing and we have now thousands of team it's very hard for our core team to give attention to each and every one so you know how we navigate through that that is also a very important thing um and uh, and apart from these things I, I i mean yeah like you know when this organization is growing like in the last you know we have grown like 400 to 500x 500 percent in the last uh, i would say six seven months we, you know now we are like 160 people globally so adding good people and, uh, you know, um, very talented people is also a very big challenge. Um, how much um, a misstep by Ethereum could expose you uh, to uh, troubling uh, developments uh, since you are on top of uh, Ethereum? How much do you depend on Ethereum's ability to keep delivering? Mm. I think like, you know, when we have to, when we want to go from 10 million users to 100 million users, Ethereum layer one needs to scale, which currently it looks like it's going in the right direction, especially with the recently the merge uh, testnet, uh, you know, for the proof of stake has successfully completed. So, you know, like one of the biggest things for us would be that this merge goes through successfully and then Ethereum is able to see at least 2x, 3x uh, increment in terms of number of transactions so that these layer 2s can you know, provide their or keep putting their uh, transactions on main chain. Otherwise, it will become so complicated that for any average users, the layer 1 will become unusable and only the layer 2 you know, platforms like us you know, will be able to put the security transactions on uh, main chain. So, Do you see any future for Polygon to be compatible or cross-chain composable with with other layer one blockchains currently we are we don't believe so we are fully dedicated to ethereum and uh, in fact like we are the first layer of defense for ethereum 
uh, you know against any of these layer ones like you know although on the on the twitter and media you will see that oh solana or whatever they are competing with ethereum but they also know that when it comes to app by app they are competing with us like user by user they are competing with us so right now uh, we are very much focused on making sure that the ethereum's uh, leadership position remains and we are the first layer of defense uh, so uh, acquiring maintaining and furthering developer relations uh, is uh, one of the crucial components as well as uh, uh, acquiring the best of those maybe in order to become part of the core uh, uh, of uh, uh, polygon developers uh, themselves uh, what are your uh, educational initiatives uh, that can uh, uh, build uh, the base uh, over the course of the next year or two in order to multiply the number of uh, people that that can uh, support yeah. polygon so i would say that you know one of the biggest thing is that we work very closely with the ethereum community on that we are a part of almost all the top ethereum hackathons plus we do hundreds of more hackathons with various different partners at the grassroots level for colleges and you know uh, early developers who are just moving from uh, this one then we also have now an university initiative uh, where we are getting a lot of like you, you know we have now representatives in china in us in india uh, where they are getting uh, you know like students who are still in their colleges to you know come to uh, web3 similarly we are we also have some initiatives where we are these are more like b2b initiatives where we are uh, helping the web2 like established web2 players to understand more about nfts to understand more about daos and see how they can use them to expand their communities and uh, you know grow their revenue models and things like that so there are multiple such initiatives going on Thank you very much for uh, this conversation and uh, congratulations for the, the fund and the acquisition, uh, as well as good luck uh, for the next six months or year uh, in continuing success. Thank you so much for having me here.